But first, some of the news from Gaza and the West Bank between May 30th and June 5th. Israeli occupation forces pounded areas across the Gaza Strip this past week, from Gaza City in the north to Rafah in the south. On Monday, Tuesday, and into today, Israel bombed central Gaza's Burej and Magazi refugee camps as Israeli troops began a ground invasion into the eastern part of the area. Al Jazeera reporter Hani Mahmoud stated on Tuesday that, quote, entire families in Burej refugee camp are caught in the line of fire right now. They cannot leave the targeted areas due to the presence of attack jets, quadcopters, and the constant artillery shelling. Ambulances and paramedics are unable to get to these areas. He added that these attacks further increase, quote, the difficulties of the situation for people who have already moved from Rafah and the western part of Rafah seeking shelter in the central area. Journalist Maha Husseini reported on Tuesday that residents were evacuating Burej refugee camp as the Israeli attacks escalated. Israel had bombed Burej camp days earlier as well on Sunday, killing six, including children. The bombing continued overnight. Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, stated earlier today that, quote, at least 70 dead people and over 300 wounded, the majority of whom are women and children, have been brought to Al-Aqsa Hospital since yesterday following heavy Israeli strikes in the middle area of the Gaza Strip. The group's medical advisor, Karen Huster, said, quote, the odor of blood in the hospital's emergency room this morning was unbearable. There are people lying everywhere, on the floor, outside. Bodies were being brought in plastic bags. The situation is overwhelming. She added, quote, medical teams in Al-Aqsa Hospital, one of the only remaining functional health facilities in the middle area, are currently trying to deal with a huge influx of patients, many of them arriving with severe burns, shrapnel wounds, fractures, and other traumatic injuries. With the insane escalation of violence in various locations in the Gaza Strip over the last 48 hours, and while the Rafah crossing point has remained closed for a month, the health system has been stretched to the point of collapse. The situation is apocalyptic. Also in central Gaza, Israeli airstrikes and tanks attacked areas in and around Nusayrat refugee camp on Sunday and again on Tuesday. Israel attacked Deir Balah in a series of strikes on Tuesday, killing at least 20 Palestinians, including eight policemen who were killed when Israeli occupation forces bombed their car. The Gaza's Interior Ministry Office stated Tuesday that the airstrike on the police officers occurred in front of a displaced person's shelter, where the police were reportedly working. The ministry stated that, quote, the occupation's perpetuation of the crime by continuing to target members of the police force with the aim of spreading chaos will fail, and the police force will continue to carry out its duty in serving the citizens, no matter the sacrifices. Philippe Lazzarini, the head of the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees, stated over the weekend that over the last month, more than one million people, most of whom have been displaced several times, were forced to flee once again in search of safety that they can never find. The United Nations said that to date, about 78% of the Gaza Strip has been placed under evacuation orders by the Israeli military. The charity Oxfam stated on Tuesday that, quote, Israel's relentless air and land bombardment and deliberate obstruction of humanitarian response is making it virtually impossible for aid agencies to reach trapped, starved civilians in Gaza as the latest ceasefire deal negotiations continue. A lethal combination of closed border crossings, ongoing airstrikes, reduced logistical capacity due to evacuation notices, and a failing Israeli permission process that debilitates humanitarian movement within Gaza have created an impossible environment for aid agencies to operate effectively. The charity added that over one million people have fled Rafah into Al Mawasi, Deir Bella, and Khan Yunus. 1.7 million people, more than two thirds of Gaza's population, are now estimated to be crammed into an area of 69 square kilometers less than a fifth of the total area of Gaza. Despite Israeli assurances that full support would be provided for people fleeing, most of Gaza has been deprived of humanitarian aid as famine inches closer. 
Last week, Israeli attacks killed dozens of civilians in tents in areas it had declared safe zones. Helmi Jerez, a 19-year-old computer science student from the Al Rimal neighborhood in Gaza City, told Al Jazeera that he and his family fled the city during Israel's attacks on Al Shifa Hospital in March. He walked all the way from Gaza City to Rafah, about 32 kilometers. A few days after he left, 14 members of his family who stayed in Gaza City were killed in an Israeli airstrike. He was sheltering for three months in Rafah until another airstrike leveled a building next to him, burying him, his siblings, and parents under the rubble. He survived, but his mother was killed. He then fled to Al-Mawasi and has been sheltering in a tent in the sand dunes there. He spoke to Al Jazeera on Monday from Dera Bella. Here's a clip from an interview with Halmi. We're now in Al Mawasi area in Khan Yunus city. We're less than two kilometers far from where the Israeli army exists in Rafah. Uh, in Mawasi area, we are super wary that the Israeli army may come again to Khan Yunus, invading the Al Mawasi area, um, making a new uh, refugees wave towards Deir al Balah or another uh, area in the south of Gaza Strip. Uh, with the, the people are super wary. You can walk in the markets in al Mas area, you always see the people looking at the south, looking at the fire that is coming from Rafah city. Uh, you can see the, uh, the nervous in all the faces uh, here in al Mawasi. I'm a computer engineer student and my brother is an AI engineer student. We know nothing but coding. And that was how our lives was before the war. Uh, all day long, just coding, all day long. This is the hardest task in our life. Now, in al Mawasi, our life is just standing in lies, uh, secure one gallon of water, or uh, just uh, guarding the tent, cooking on fire. This is uh, the picture I was talking last year, when we, on our last day uh, in high school. At the um, left, it is me, Hilmi. Uh, my name in Arabic means my dream, in the middle, uh, my mother, Ibtisam, which in Arabic means smile, and she always smiled. And at the right, my identical twin brother, Muhammad. What do you dream of today, Helmi? A safe place, a safe place, and just another opportunity to get my family back together and to get my family back on foot. And in a safe place, we lost our house, we lost our relatives, we lost the most precious thing in life, which is my mom. I just want my family to get back together on one table, in a safe place, that I'm not worried uh, tonight, that I can sleep safely and don't think about that a, a rocket may hit us. I mean, the bombing that killed my mother in Rafah, it was at 2.10 a.m. after midnight. We all were asleep. That was Helmi Jerez, a 19-year-old computer science student, speaking to Al Jazeera on Monday. In northern Gaza, Palestinians returned to their neighborhoods following the Israeli army's withdrawal in Jabalia and Gaza City. Journalists captured video of the Israeli army shelling people as they attempted to inspect their homes near the destroyed University College of Applied Sciences, where bodies were discovered to have been crushed by tanks. The Gaza municipality organized a public campaign to clear the streets of Gaza City following the Israeli army's withdrawal. Dozens of Palestinians working with their neighborhood committees worked to remove their mountains of rubble and debris. Last week, the Israeli army withdrew from Jabalia after a 20-day operation that left the area and its refugee camp, the largest of the Gaza Strip's eight camps, almost unrecognizable. Our colleague Tamara Nassar reported that the Israeli army had ordered residents of Jabalia to evacuate the area earlier in May, following a previous invasion that ended in December, and that this latest ground invasion was combined with aerial bombardment. Israel conducted 200 airstrikes in the area during a period of less than three weeks. Photos and videos circulated on social media as Palestinians started to return to their neighborhoods in and around Jabalia and the Jabalia refugee camp on Thursday. However, people were still shot at by Israeli quadcopter drones on their way to return to their homes. On Thursday, Al Jazeera's Mohammed Shaheen reported from Jabalia and explained the vast scale of the destruction. 
couple of trans. We are now at the trans intersection in Jabalia camp in the north of the Gaza Strip, where the Israeli occupation forces have destroyed expansive parts of the camp. Most property and civilians' belongings have been destroyed in the Israeli military operation that lasted nearly 20 days. The Israeli occupation forces withdrew from the camp on Thursday morning, leaving in their wake this vast destruction. Fires resulting from Israeli shelling continue to burn. The Israeli forces continue to fire weapons in this street, which leads to Zayed and Beit Hanun neighborhoods. So the situation is still dangerous. Some residents tried to go down this road towards the northern parts of the Jabalia camp, but came under fire. We can see here that a firebelt bombing targeted this street, causing vast destruction. We can still hear the sound of artillery shells at the other end of this street. Look at the scale of destruction in Jabalia. The Israelis have destroyed us. They're actually testing their missiles on us. Residents here say that this scale of destruction is as a result of Israeli use of weapons provided by the United States. They say that the Gaza Strip, including Jabalia camp, has been used by Israel as a testing ground for weapons. That was Al Jazeera's Mohammed Shaheen reporting from Jabalia last week. Satellite imagery showed the amount of Israel's destruction of Jabalia between mid-April and the end of May. On Sunday, Gaza's Civil Defense Corps said that they had been working three days in a row to recover bodies buried under the rubble. Tamara reports that, quote, now amid the rubble of their destroyed homes, Palestinians are returning to the camp from which they evacuated a few weeks ago. They are erecting makeshift tents amid the debris and demonstrating resilience by caring for stray cats, illustrating their determination to revive their community despite the devastation. She adds, quote, Jabalia's resilience haunts the Israeli army. The resilience can be seen in the strong culture of armed struggle in the camp. And we'll have much more on the armed struggle by Palestinian fighters in Jabalia with John Elmer later on in this broadcast. For much more on Jabalia, read Tamara Nassar's latest report, Invasions Fail to Break the Spirit of Resistance in Jabalia, as well as Everything I Loved Has, has, has Gone by Osama Abu Jasser on electronicintifada.net. A new report released by the Geneva-based Euromed Human Rights Monitor says that Israel is ramping up its use of armed quadcopter drones to kill, injure, and terrorize Palestinians across Gaza. These drones have killed dozens of civilians, as confirmed by Euromed Monitor in earlier reports, by firing automatic machine guns mounted beneath an aircraft at random gatherings or shooting directly at people, Euromed reports. Israel's army is using the so-called Smash Dragon system made by the Israeli company Smart Shooter, which can be supplied to various aircraft. Also, the Matrice 600, 600 and the Thor aircraft made by the company Elbit Systems, all of which are highly mobile and versatile. Uh, that is ideal for short-term operations. Their systems can automatically search buildings and create maps to identify possible targets, carry lethal or non-lethal payloads, and carry out a variety of missions for military personnel and special forces, Euromed states. The group adds that, quote, Israel has used quadcopter drones in a systematic and widespread manner lately to carry out extrajudicial executions and premeditated killings of Palestinian civilians, according to testimonies gathered by Euromed Monitor. These drones are used in particular against civilians who attempt to return and inspect their homes after the Israeli military retreats from areas it has attacked by land or air. They say that some drones were made, were made mainly for use in photography and other industries, but were converted by the Israeli army into intelligence aircraft and instead used for extrajudicial killings and executions. Drones with various attributes and functional features, known as quadcopters, are produced by Israeli military companies. With a diameter of no more than one meter, they are simple to program and use for remote electronic flying. Euromed reports. The United Nations Agency for Palestine Refugees stated this week that all of the agency's 36 shelters in Rafah are empty now, after Palestinians have been forced to flee and all health and critical services have been forced to stop. 
Martin Griffiths, the United Nations humanitarian chief, said that the UN does not have the capacity to deliver humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in Rafah, in southern Gaza, and in the enclave's central areas. Quote, we know what we need and we know we what we haven't got. Griffiths said. We need fuel and it's not being brought in in great numbers. We need truckloads of food that get through. According to the United Nations, aid deliveries have dropped by two-thirds since Israel's invasion of Rafah. Oxfam stated that the Rafah crossing, which has been closed for more than a month now since May 7th, there are more than 2,000 aid trucks, the majority of which are carrying food, stuck in a 28-mile traffic jam back to the Egyptian city of Arish. The World Health Organization stated that since May 7th, when Israeli forces seized control of the Rafah crossing, Israel has blocked all medical evacuations from taking place. The WHO estimates that there are as many as 11,000 Palestinians who need urgent medical evacuation out of Gaza. 20 international aid agencies issued a joint warning over the weekend on the further disintegration of access to humanitarian aid. The statement notes that Doctors Without Borders, one of the largest humanitarian and medical providers in Gaza, has been unable to get any supplies into the enclave since May 6th. The lack of clean water supplies puts patients at high risk of disease. Yet desalination kits and submersible pumps to set up sustainable water systems to provide water are almost always denied by the Israeli authorities. The aid agencies, they say, quote, now fear an acceleration in deaths from starvation, disease, and denied medical assistance, while land and sea entry points remain effectively shut to meaningful humanitarian assistance, most desperately fuel, and attacks in areas sheltering civilians intensify. The United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, stated that children are still dying of hunger in Gaza. One baby reportedly died of starvation and lack of available medical treatment at the Al-Aqsa Hospital in Deir Balah on May 30th, and another 13-year-old child died on June 1st. UNICEF's communications chief, Jonathan Cricks, stated, quote, if nutrition supplies, especially ready-to-use therapeutic food used to address malnutrition among children cannot be distributed, the treatment of more than 3,000 children with acute malnutrition will be interrupted. The ongoing situation in Rafah is a disaster for children, he said. He explained that in the agency's experience in similar crises around the world, quote, usually children don't die from malnutrition and dehydration in hospitals. They die at home in the street, or where they have taken shelter. This means reported deaths of children from malnutrition only show part of the whole toll. There is reasonable concern that in Gaza too, there are significant numbers of children affected by malnutrition who are not represented in reported figures. Turning to the occupied West Bank, Israeli forces stormed Ramallah and the adjacent town of Albire last Thursday, ca causing a devastating fire in the main vegetable market that, that destroyed dozens of shops. Middle East Eye reported that Israeli soldiers raided the neighboring West Bank cities at dawn on May 30th, firing live ammunition, stun grenades, and tear gas in residential areas and at the local market known, known as al Hisba. Wooden carts caught on fire and the flames spread throughout the market and to nearby commercial buildings, wounding at least one person and ravaging over a hundred stalls and shops, according to Albira's acting mayor, Robin Al-Khatib. Palestinian politician Mustafa Barghouti stated that Israeli forces also stole money from currency exchange offices during the raid. In May, Israeli forces stormed 11 branches of the same money exchange company stealing more than, uh, than $1 million in currency, in currency. On Monday, Israeli forces killed three Palestinians and injured at least eight others during an invasion into the northern city of Nablus. One of those killed was Adam Faraj, a 23-year-old former prisoner and fighter with the Balata Batal Battalion, who was shot by Israeli troops while he was on his way to his sister's wedding. Video of the killing of Adam Faraj showed the Israeli soldiers desecrating and kicking his body and then dragging it away. On Tuesday, Israeli forces killed two Palestinian men by firing at their car in the city of, of Tulkarem. 
More than 20 Palestinians were swept up in mass arrest campaigns by Israeli forces on Tuesday, according to the Palestinian Prisoners Society and the Commission of Detain of Detain of detained and ex-detainees affairs. The group said that the arrest took place across the occupied West Bank governorates of Ramallah, Bethlehem, Nablus, Salfit, Tubas, Jericho, and Jerusalem. The raids were accompanied by widespread uh, abuse and threats against detainees and their families, the Wafa News Agency reported. The total number of Palestinians detained in the occupied West Bank has risen to more than 9,000 since October 7th. This figure includes individuals taken from their homes at military checkpoints, those who surrendered under duress, and those taken hostage by Israeli forces. In the West Bank since October 7th, more than 500 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli soldiers and settlers, and nearly 5,000 others have been injured by Israeli army fire, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. And in the South Hebron Hills, Israeli forces demolished a home in Al Jawaya and, and assaulted the owner of the house, hitting him with a rifle, according to the Palestinian rights group Al Haq. At least 250 homes have been destroyed by Israel since the beginning of the year, Al Haq stated. And finally, we wanted to bring you some images and videos from journalists and others in Gaza who are not just relentlessly documenting the unspeakable atrocities but also making sure to highlight the resilience, joy, and determination of the Palestinian people. A pharmacist, Omar Hamad, who is sheltering in Dera Balah, filmed himself and his father using a manual sewing machine to help displaced people repair their torn clothes. <laughs> A woman created a short video of herself while, while she cleaned and cleared debris in her home in Jabalia following the Israeli army's withdrawal. You can hear the Israeli drones hovering above while she works, but she added music to her video as well. Youth in Jabalia, upon re returning to their neighborhood, fed stray cats and took a selfie. Our contributor Abu Bakr Abed made a short video report with kids in Dera Balah this week, thanking professional soccer players who participated in the Children of Gaza charity match that took place on June 1st in London. As you can see, we are here in one of the largest displacement camps across the Gaza Strip. Children, traumatized children, deprived of food, water, and everything. They are striving to find some means of life here. We see your charity game for tomorrow held by Anwar El Ghazi and other professional footballers across the globe, like Sam Mosey and Adama Traore and many others. We would like to thank you here from Gaza for your immense support and for this charity game. Knowing that the children of Gaza see you and are sending a big, big message of love to you from here, despite the truly unbearable circumstances. That was Abu Bakr Abed. He also took these photos of displaced people in tents in Dera Bala, watching the UEFA Champions League game on Sunday, as he said, under Israeli bombings and buzzing drones. Other photos and videos of displaced Palestinians finding a way to watch the match circulated on social media. We like this one of children watching the match and rooting for Real Madrid, which won the championship.
And finally, Steve Sosabi, formerly of the Palestine Children's Relief Fund, who now runs the Heal Palestine Project, shared this video of a girl, Sara, who is re- who is successfully recovering from extreme burns after her home in Gaza was bombed in December, an attack that killed two of her brothers. Steve says that Heal Palestine flew her by medical plane to New York three months ago, and now she is, quote, dancing her way out of the hospital thanks to the amazing staff at Northwell and Staten Island Burn Center. You gotta stop. That was filmed by Steve Sosabi of the Heal Palestine Project. And that's it for the news roundup. As always, go to electronicintifada.net for much more, especially to read our new features by our phenomenal writers in Gaza. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.